take that breath. Because we need it, folks. A flood is coming. Yes, as we begin our Lentil journey, we are going to be flooded. Flooded with what? Folks, we're going to be flooded with the love of God. It's going to be coming in the form of water. I'm going to be talking about Noah and the incredible, the incredible effect that that story has had on human history. Numerous cultures around the world, there is a significant flood story. Now, as with other stories, we can, it doesn't matter. You can take this literally, historically, metaphorically. That is a lot of water from the tip of Mount Everest right down to the Mariana Trench. You're looking at about, woohoo, about 37,000 feet. However, look at where this story came from, where it emerged. Mesopotamia, modern day Iraq, in between the Tigris and Euphrates River. And when these rivers flood, because they still flood even today, in 2021, for these folks, it really does appear as the whole world is flooded. Quite, yeah, quite seriously. I'm gonna go just walk back in human history to a story you may have heard of. If not, let's explore it. The epic story of Gilgamesh. Sumerian king, which, looking at the screen right now, you can actually go to this site. It is about 120 kilometers southwest of the modern day city of Baghdad in Iraq, and you can visit this archeological site. Uh, it's not the safest place to go, even if there was no COVID, but you can actually go there. And in cuneiform, which is very different than uh, our modern contemporary English, or even Paleo-Hebrew or Arabic, uh, there are inscriptions about Gilgamesh and the city of Uruk, U-R-U-K, Uruk. So what happened here? Gilgamesh, the story, goes back 228, 3,000 years before Christ. So our time, talking about a story which is happening around 5,000 years ago. He was a warrior king. <laughs> and he ruled his people with great force. He wasn't the nicest guy in town. And uh, the gods, the Mesopotamian understanding of God, specifically five, conspired to bring a great flood. The metaphorical understanding of flood, water, you think of water, you clean your house, uh, your dishes, your laundry, your car, water is a cleansing agent, okay? But this is a big, okay, a big, big bucket of water from the heavens above is gonna be cleansing the area between the Tigris and Euphrates River, which for these people, it really is, the whole world is flooded, now, quite seriously. So, Gilgamesh does not know this. However, he has a conflict in the story, and that's significant today. It was yesterday, February 17th, the conflict that Gilgamesh is having is his immortality. Yes, he's the warrior king, powerful ruler. However, he's not gonna be living forever. He is immortal, and one day Gilgamesh knows he will die. Ash Wednesday, just yesterday, you get the sign of the cross, okay, Ash, right here on your forehead. What does that mean? From dust we came, to dust we shall return. It's, it's gonna happen. Um, unless something in our time, a 
figure out transhumanism, how to transport our consciousness to a computer, uh, like maybe Star Trek's time, maybe Gene Roddenberry knows how to do that. That's actually the direction we're all heading. Um, that's the reminder. It's, it's actually very important, Ash Wednesday. Uh, when they get that sign, that uh, the ashes burning the palms and putting the ash of the cross on the forehead. So, Gilgamesh, the warrior king, what must I do? He's going to go on a journey, folks, to find an answer to this very perplexing question. How does he overcome death? So, the gods have a friend, Enkidu, his companion, and they travel together, and he is crushed. I'm going to um, go through the story quickly. Enkidu dies, and Gilgamesh asks a wise sage that he meets on his journey how to deal with his immortality. He gives him his knowledge, how he can govern, how he can also win the love of the people. So remember, as I said earlier, he's not the nicest guy in town. So Gilgamesh wants to know, how did this wise sage come to know all this information? Because he wasn't God, he was a human. What, what happened here? Listen to these words, folks. The wise sage told Gilgamesh, name of a god, En, E-N, told him that a great flood was coming. Okay? A great flood. Here again, the pre-Genesis story. In the predominant city of Uruk, which you can visit this archaeological ruin today. And... He was told to build a mammoth boat. Okay. One, approximately one acre service covering, um, six decks high, about 180 feet in length. And on this boat would be his loved ones, his family, and the seed of all living creation at his time. So there was going to be a life preserved, the waters would come, cleanse, and then he would impart the knowledge of how to live, how to live as the gods wanted them to, to live justly, to be a righteous ruler. So Gilgamesh is, oh, he's aghast, fascinating, he was unaware of this. He does not find the answer to his question, how does he overcome his immortality? Mm. However, what happens? Gilgamesh returns to the kingdom in Uruk, and the very first order he gives is to open up the treasury and give money to the poor. Now, just look, look at the facets of the story. Let's walk into Genesis and Noah. Noah tries to intervene and save his people. However, he is unable to do so. But God just commands him to build a large ark. Now, there's two versions in here, which in ancient Israel, this is not considered a contradiction. It may appear that way to our eyes. You can see it right on the screen, two by two. Okay, each animal, uh, and not to worry, the lions, uh, are vegetarian here, just like in the movie Madagascar. Uh, perhaps the penguins went fishing and got them some fish and they ate that. I have no idea what happened, how Noah how dealt with this, but they, they weren't all eating each other. So there they go. They aboard the ark, uh, along with the giraffes, the elephants, and wow, I don't know if there was a vet in there, but anyways, we're not going to worry about that. So there's also another tradition where the animals come seven by seven, okay? So two by two, seven by seven, and the unclean animals, I know, I know, especially if you like Canadian grade A pork, oops, we didn't make it, but uh, you know, there are pigs there too, so at least the pigs didn't get in there. But this is not considered a contradiction, whether it's uh, one pair of animals or seven. Anyways, the point is that the animals and, 
and his family are safe. Now, there's one additional subtlety to this story. If we look in the Quran's version of this story, uh, Prophet Noah also suffers personal tragedy. He has three sons in Genesis. Chapter of the Quran, he's actually got four. Shem is the fourth. And Shem does not listen to his dad, Noah. No. He decides not to board the ark, and he is going to go to the highest mountaintop, and, well, he thinks he's going to escape the water, but that does not happen. It's very similar, the stories, Genesis and in the Quran. Waves, the highest mountains come. This is the picture you're seeing on the screen right now. They envelop the land between, it's not mentioned, but this is my own opinion, between the Tigris and Euphrates River, and the area is flooded. There's a large boat, there you see Noah with the animals, his family's on board. Of course, the Quran's version minus his fourth son. In Genesis, his whole family is safe. So, three different stories from three different cultures of a great flood narrative. Now, what do we do with this? The words, um, we sang them earlier. One God, many names. One God, many peoples. One God from sky and sea and earth has called us here. There's something consistent. It's right, uh, Ten Commandments, commandment number one, monotheism. There really is one God. However, with the diversity in cultures, um, not everyone is Greek speaking or Latin speaking. Um, different stories emerge. Uh, stories get changed. Uh, prophets speak to people in their languages. I'm speaking in contemporary English. If I was speaking right now to you in Urdu, it would be a very confusing message, wondering what the heck is Andrew talking about. Even if I was switched to Spanish, it, it would be a little bit easier, but it would also be confusing. So, when you hear these stories, and it goes, well, wait a minute. That's not, in, that's not in the Bible. You don't have to take it as, you know, this is true. You're, you're welcome to disagree with that. I just want to introduce this to you to show you how wide, and I can't even imagine how wide it is, folks, and how impressive God's love is. That even in our time, and if you, well, it's not safe, but I can show you the pictures. You can go visit a site in modern day Iraq, the city of Uruk, and, you, and in the Louvre, in Paris, France, the story of Gilgamesh is preserved in Sumerian text and cuneiform of the great flood story. Now this, this is really amazing. For me, when I, as we approach Lent, and I come before God, I have my biases, I do, and I put them aside. I want to come out of my comfort zone. And folks, it's a little scary, but I go forward. The reason I go forward is because I have faith in Christ Jesus. Now, I've said three stories. You've heard something similar. A great flood, you got the use of water. The wise sage the Redeemer, the dove, and Noah coming back as a sign that it's safe. And the boat, the ark, and the story, it's sitting, it docks on Mount Ararat. What else comes to your mind as you think water, dove, <clears throat> savior, healer? Our society right now, 2021, uh, we definitely need that person. The good news, and that's what Christianity is as we get into the New Testament. It's not a new book. It's a scripture of the Jewish people. But it's a new message. That message, the logos, Greek, the word made flesh from Mark. Jesus is baptized. You have the use of water. The Holy Spirit 
coming in, for, in the presence of a dove. We also saw this in our reading of Genesis and the ark. Something else. It rained for 40 days and 40 nights. And Mark, at the end of the baptism, the Spirit sends Jesus out in the wilderness, his journey. He's tempted for, you guessed it, 40 days and 40 nights. Now, what actually happened during this time, we do not know for Mark, but if we read Luke and Matthew, they explain to us what was going on during this temptation period. So you see a continuation of a story. The images, water, massive flood, boat, an ark. Where else in Old Testament you see ark? It's there. Think about it. Ready? You got it? One, two, three. The ark of the covenant. Oh, and guess what's in the Ark of the Covenant? It's the tablets. And if you're thinking Steve Jobs made it, no, 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 he didn't. That's, that's way before his time. This is the Ten Commandments and commandment number one. I've already stated. It's monotheism. Okay? We sang it also in Psalm. One God, many names. I know that's, that, that can be like stressful and it can maybe even upset some people because you're, whether it's Hebrew, Arabic, Sanskrit, uh, uh, pre, I mean, two thousand, even Mandarin, uh, 2,000 years ago is different than it is today. But this Lenten journey, I just want to invite you. Okay, we, you don't have to do it. You never have to do anything. But as you heard, the words from Mark, our New Testament reading, the water, okay? Even Jesus is baptized. God's only son, even he, he's baptized too, okay? The dove comes down. You see that on the screen. The Holy Spirit, the triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Boom, they're all right there. And he emerges from the water. As we enter Lent, Let's look at our, what we know, our look at our knowledge, look at our faith, our relationship. That's really important. What's our relationship with Jesus Christ here? And what does the love of Christ mean for us in this Lenten journey? Okay, that's a significant question. This Lenten journey, what does the love of Christ mean for us? Did it just begin 2,000 years ago? Is Christianity just a New Testament religion? Some folks will, yes, um, there is the Old Testament, but the priority is clearly given to the New Testament. That's okay. I'm a little different, but we have diversity. God's creation is very diverse. Folks, we also have archaeological evidence of what I shared with you, the story of Gilgamesh. It's uh, preserved in museums. Uh, you can go visit a site in modern day Iraq. Um, I tried to uh, find it when I went to Turkey, pieces of the Ark. However, I was, uh, I was not successful in finding that. Um, I found a lot of other interesting things, which I'll share with you later on future services. But what, when my own journey, especially following the death of my parents, I really started to feel, and I still am. And I admit, I don't know. I don't know the limits of God's love because they're so vast that it's clearly written about within both our testaments in the Bible. However, this is my opinion. I believe that same love is present not only through the Jewish and Muslim faiths, but all the faiths along the Silk Road, going back even into Mesopotamia, Gilgamesh, the presence of the divine, even before the planet Earth, in this how big's the universe? I have no idea, I can't even imagine that. But it's there, the love of our creator is there, it's real, I will, I will be dust, 
before I ever fully understand it. But I keep my mind open, okay? I keep my mind open. And as I'm journeying in Lent, I want to share my, my fears with you. There may be some things which I may not like, which may make me feel uncomfortable. And the same thing may happen with you, but that's okay because we're human. And when you look at the letters of Paul, as he wrote to the people in Corinth, in Ephesus, what does Paul talk about? I should say the Ephesians, that you are okay as you are right now. All right? You don't need to go to theology school. You don't need a master's in divinity. You don't need a PhD. Um, just a side note. Do you know what PhD stands for? I did learn this in my last year in seminary. I thought it was Doctor of Philosophy. However, folks, it's actually Pizza Hut delivery. So, you know, when you think about, think about let's make a big pizza, you know, that would be fun to do. Think of the church reopening and, and we can make a big pizza and you know, we can put the pepperoni, we can put the green peppers, maybe the green peppers can be like Old Testament, red peppers can be New Testament and, and pepperoni could maybe be Gilgamesh and you know, the pineapples, maybe, maybe that'd be something from the Bhagavad Gita. Who, I mean, that's a yummy pizza. I mean, I'm kind of a little distracted right now. I know it's not lunchtime, but I, got, I promise I won't leave right now and go for lunch, I promise. But you see the diversity there, okay? You see that diversity. God is working in many cultures, in many languages, in many shapes and forms, some of which to us are completely foreign and wondering, what the heck is Andrew talking about? The great mystery of God. I can't tell you. I can't tell you what, what God is. I recognize God through Christ Jesus, what I read in the Bible, but I know I can't place God in one book, Alpha and Omega, this is it. No, in everything else, some scholars, some people, and I respect them, say that if it's not in the Bible, it's error, it's wrong. Well, I'll leave that for you to judge. But this Lent, this Lenten season, Look in Genesis 9, 6, the good news. Noah offers a sacrifice when the flood waters recede. And the sign of the covenant, what is it, folks? There it is, you see it on the screen. It's the rainbow, okay? And in Genesis 9, 8, God makes a promise that never again will there be a massive flood which will deluge the whole earth and we'll have to make an ark or we'll have to quickly rush and put on our scuba diving equipment. I'm sure no one in Noah's family was a licensed scuba diver. But we're safe. God has made his promise. And as we've learned in our New Testament reading, he's with us. His love is real. It's Christ Jesus I'm talking about. The Spirit is with us. And this Lent, this Lenten journey, let us uplift the mystery. Here it is. The mystery of creation. God's love as we open up the Bible and the waters rushing forth. We see the ark coming. You see the giraffe. You see the elephant. We know uh, all the creatures swimming in the ocean, they're safe. Jonah's whale, safe because there's well, a lot of water. They got nothing to worry about. But let's expand, think of the oceans, what would, what would this Lenten season, if you were to imagine the limitless boundaries of God's love, what would that look like? I invite you into that journey. Let's begin that as we continue throughout Lent. The unlimited, the limitless boundaries of God's love. Christ has died. He hath risen. He shall come again. Amen.
One thing I wanted to share with you, and I'm going to put up the YouTube address right there. You see it on the screen. God has a place for all of us in the choir. Yes, this was a request. I'm following through on the request. Thank you. You see, there's uh, Noah in the art. Uh, on the ark, and of course you see the beavers as well. I think my singing voice would probably be like the beavers, uh, giving all the other animals a hysterical fit, uh, what's gonna be going on. But when you listen, folks, when you listen to the words from Celtic Thunder, because I, I, I love it, it was, it's really good, um, you see an ark, exactly what, uh, what we heard from Genesis. A mammoth boat, what we heard from the epic story of Gilgamesh, and how God, as a place for all of us. You can have a, a great singing voice, beautiful, or you, know, you can even have a singing voice like me. However, God still has a place for all of us in the choir. Now, the Jesus Sutras. Uh, this, I think, makes, I even know the author, Martin Palmer. It'd make a very interesting Lenten study. What this is, it's Christianity, but it's in, written in Mandarin, okay? It was about 1,500 years ago, so the Chinese is a little different than it is today, just like 1,500 years ago. The English spoken will be a little different than it is today.